the winner and Crisp is second. Lescargo's just coming up now to be third. And here we are at Entry Racecourse, 50 years on from the most gripping Grand Nationals of all. By the winning post, this is where the great Red Rum now rests, this hallowed turf commemorating his win in 1973 as the BBC soundtrack went from O'Sullivan to Hammer to Wilson, back to Sir Peter O'Sullivan to cool the great Red Rum running down the Australian crisp. He won it the next year, then twice placed before really cementing himself in history and winning it for a third time. We've got a repeat bidder again this year, but we're, what, seven hours away from finding out which horse will etch themselves into the history books in 2023. It's a bit surreal at the time and you don't fully comprehend what's after happening and possibly still haven't. Horses for courses has to come for something, I think. Well, I'm going to go I think I win the English National. You think I win it with Delta Work? Delta Work, yeah, if the ground is soft. really good form. He's versatile regards ground. I think he'll stay. He's got a good profile for the race having won the Coral Trophy this year. We know what it's like to win a national dear Arthur. He was a uh fantastic horse and he gave us one of our best days racing and uh, now Corex having to be prepared and, and see if we can do the same. Really excited about the action unfolding later on today. The world's greatest steeplechase and a really good supporting card of races. Mark Howard and Dan Barber alongside me in the sunshine, Mark. It's glorious. It's glorious compared to 24 hours ago, Tom. It never stopped raining yesterday, but it's yeah, it's, it's fantastic weather, fantastic racing, and might just have an impact in the ground on the ground. This Tom might be a few change of selections. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, funny you should say that, Mark. There might be a few. Uh, last minute shouts to, to change your mind, which Mark Howard has done. More on that, more on that later. Um, what's the overall feeling, Grand National Morning, Dan Barber? Yep, yeah, really buzzing for it, of course. I mean, you've got it's a weird shape. We've just been chatting, haven't yeah. we? It's different to what we've become accustomed to. It's like more one of the, it's like one of the, the more old school races, if you yeah, like, I, that compared to what we've had in recent times. I, yeah, I think it's sort of ticking two boxes. It scores really highly for quality, and we always talk about the increase in quality in the Grand National. Yeah. Horses now routinely rated in the mid 160s are running in the race, which they wouldn't have done. But back in the day, when you were getting horses out of the weights, if you got this year, they'd be like rated in the 120s and stuff. So it is a weird, weird feel. I think it's 10 years. Look. Uh, quick scan earlier since we had any horses out of the weights and we've got more than a fifth of the field out of the handicap this year so they could be a real gulf actually top to bottom do you do you think part of that mark is that is a little bit of british feel of what's the point 
I think I think there is a, certainly an element of that, and I think that was indicated when the original entries came out yeah. back in February, when, whenever it was. But you know, all, all said and done, we have got I think we've got seven Grade One winners in the field. We've got six Cheltenham Festival winners in the field as well. So as you said, there's a real mix, isn't there? The fact we've got horses out of the handicap is a negative, but I think indicates the fact we've got Grade One winners is a, is a pointer to how strong the race becomes in terms of class horses. And probably a case in point is Capadano today. In a normal year, he'd be going for a Gold Cup, wouldn't he? The, the, yeah. the, the Grand National just seems to attract a sort of a classier type of horse. Do you fancy him? I do now that the Sunday. There you I go. Do. He's one of the late changes. Do, do you think, seriously think it'll have a? Is, is it going to ride a good bit quicker than you expected? Well, going home last night and having sat in the rain for about five hours yesterday afternoon, it carried on last evening. I was expecting to come back this morning, soft, even possibly heavy ground. But mm -hmm. I got in the press room. Mike Vince was in there. He assured me it's good to soft, soft in places, and and it is quite by five fifteen. If this carries on, which is forecast to, it could be nearer good to soft and soft. So. But, you know, that, that's hence I've, I've swung more towards Capadano. And, and I think only three and a half minutes of, of rain recorded yesterday. Yes. That sort of belies the, the, the feeling of it being well here. That. Yeah. <laughs> My notes would attest to something rather heavier than that. It's, I mean, that's a point worth making, isn't it? It is quarter past five. We're here at yeah. half ten-ish. Yeah. We've got another nearly seven hours of glorious sunshine if this continues that will possibly have a big impact we'll, we'll see the times in the earlier races they're not on the run on the same track of course the national course is a is a thing of its own but it seemed to be soft ground yesterday and that was departure from the first day where it was probably good actually rather than good to soft how, how do you feel about all the before we get into the runners and riders how do you feel about the the build up this year and, and definitely the, the the negativity from some outside factions the the, the interviews that we've had sort of again putting the national in, in the spotlight as somebody within racing do you do you fear for that each and every year or is it just part and parcel of what we have to deal with yeah I, th I think it's a part of you you just sort of want to say just sort of leave us alone we can we can look after ourselves but you do have to be more front foot kevin blake had a good crack on one of the tv channels the other day where he was arguing the case and i think fundamentally there are a lot of questions from their point of view that they'd have to answer what if you stop racing overnight trainers won't carry on who's looking after these horses i mean i wouldn't even want to speculate the number of thoroughbreds in britain and ireland but it'll be in the tens of thousands and how many of those would actually be able to be cared for subsequently so that obviously brings a terrifying thought of what would have to happen to them and they'd be a lot more wiped out than in that sort of incident than they would be from them racing over a sustained period of time. It's high tens of thousands, isn't it? It's good to see Julie Harrington, Mark, from the Chief Secretary of the BHA, sort of getting a, a chance for a repost on, on Good Morning Britain. Do you, do you feel that the industry has been, been front foot enough in, in, in tackling all this in a, in, as a response? Uh, I think so. I think the, you've just got to be so careful nowadays, and not just in horses, just in life in general. You, you can't just sort of 10 years ago, you, you sort of play it off and reckon it didn't really matter but it's just the way life is nowadays you've, you've got to be conscious of outside factors and yeah I think I think there is an element of you approach this meeting slight trepidation hoping no horses have killed that's almost the first thing that's reported nowadays as yeah. soon as they finish thankfully all the horses are okay but that, that's just modern life you've yeah. just got to accept it and I think whatever you know, whatever happens today we want to be open and front foot about it and own it and I think that, that's, the, that's the most yeah. most important thing um, what, what are the potential stories then that we, that we think are, are going to play out today obviously we've got to repeat bidder, which is a which is a big part of it. I personally would love to see Ted Walsh win it after yeah. the last couple of years, in particular last year when I I thrust a microphone in front of his face just in the in the sort of winners enclosure when he finished second and he you know he answered the question but he was clearly gutted. What, what about you potential well, that, story that, as well? That would be a great story just to hear Ted Walsh after a Grand National win would be, <laughs> yes. would be worth its weight in gold, wouldn't it? He's come so close. That would be a very good story. Noble Yates, as you say, it'd be great for Lucinda Russell for winning oh, twice. It? The irony of one for Arthur died at the end of last month she's had a great meeting so far so Corrit Ramble could, could pull it off so yeah there's any number of stars there always is in the national I remember we won for Arthur thinking he'll be too far out the back he can't win it but you, that it's different now isn't it because you can yeah and Corrit Ramble he'll be another one hunting around I remember thinking after Warwick when he won the classic chase wow this horse has done something you don't do in these staying chases he's come from the back yeah realizing he might be a bit different and then getting to the national and thinking Oh, we get too far back. I mean, it was completely stu complete stupidity on my part. I think Corrett Ramble might be a better horse than one for Arthur. I think he's got a serious engine. I mean, to win Cheltenham handicaps while basically taking the mickeys 
is something in itself. He's £10 well in officially. I can definitely see a scenario where if he's fit and raring to go in 12 months' time, he'll have the same sort of weight that the likes of Delta Work and, and Galvin have to date around that 160 mark. I do think he's that good. Oh, just on sort of hard races at Cheltenham, I looked back at Gaia de Menil, for example, and thought, whoa, that was, uh, yeah, you know, he, he, he might not have won had, had, no, the, no. had Marlon Mission stood up. Yeah, I agree. But I don't look at Corrat Rambler and go, he had a tough race. No, totally different circumstances, really. Corrat Rambler was almost hunted around, wasn't he, for yeah. a circuit, then he was produced. Galad de Mesnil, he had a hard race from coming down the hill, didn't he? Yeah. He looked a beaten horse, so I totally agree. But just talking about the national in general, Noble Yates win last year threw all the trends out the window, didn't he? Seven-year-old doesn't win a Grand National, a novice doesn't win a Grand National, and he came out and, and won in such a style. So, so has that changed your approach? It has a bit, yeah. It, was, it has, because it, it showed, funny enough, Cappadano was a seven-year-old as well this time. So so it definitely has, yeah. I mean, who would have thought a novice would win a Grand National? And yeah. It was on his eighth start over the over the over regulation fences, let alone national fences. Yeah, yeah rule the world brought that course. mold when he became the first novice. But he had a full season of not winning races. He was a first season chaser, Noble Yates. I mean, it speaks definitely of the creative campaign in Emmett Mullins. I don't think many trainers would have gone for it, but I think it's a good thing. As it breaks down barriers that, and it'll yeah. encourage other trainers to be more daring, even if the 27 to 12 Irish ratio in terms of number of runners today suggests that the British is still either don't have the ammunition or are minded to not have a crack at the rate or campaign the horses for it. Are, are you surprised at the money that's come for Ain't That a Shame, Dan? I am to some extent, yeah. He's, he's possibly well handicapped and he's possibly got the tools to cope with the Grand National. Good jumper, goes with enthusiasm. But he's now the same price as the horse in Corrat Rambler, who is without a shadow of a doubt very well handicapped because he'll be ten pounds higher next time he runs. I'd make Corrat Rambler favourite for the race personally. The, the the slight elephant in the room is the fitness of Derek Fox, isn't it? That's yeah. another story. I mean, I thought that was amazing yesterday to see Stephen McQueen, one of the second or third string jockeys in that stable, with Patrick Wodge having emerged, not only riding such a a confident race on Douglas talking to just have the conviction to go out and finishing second probably pretty heartbreaking and then just unbowed yesterday on Apple away and well, I'm going to ride the same race and they've had a tremendous week again already and it could in my opinion get better still they've been a real shining light for the for the for the north of England and Scotland haven't they they have they've, they've, they've invested so much in especially the point to point the, the mayor who won yesterday she only cost 35 grand to remember the high and York won the race a couple of years ago heart testing was, was third in the race Grand National winning trainer they, they, by losing the zone admission last autumn and going back six months they've made a conscious effort to invest heavily in, in horses and it's it's really you know it's bearing fruit now and, and they're becoming a real powerhouse in the north I always say this with them I mean I, me and Mark will spend a lot of time on northern race courses looking at Lucinda's horses you can identify them without without a saddle cloth or any of the connections that she just buy sources these distinctive strapping chasing types and it doesn't always work out buying that type of animal but they're doing it in that bracket that Mark's referencing the 35 to 70 grand which to you and I is a lot of money but in racing it's a, a fraction of what someone will spend she's, oh, but she's, she's come a long way in a short space of time I, I remember going around Hexham and you'd see there all the horses used to have bandages on the front on the front legs she's almost like a summer jumps trainer in the north and obviously the combination with Peter Scudamore has made a huge difference and, and they're, they're a great um, duo and Tom Scudamore will be part of our coverage throughout the afternoon as well uh, alongside me uh, ok we will be getting stuck into the Grand National amongst other races very soon in much more detail uh, for now we're going to head out to Nile Hamilton Thanks, Tom, and with Sadiq, who's just walked the track with some of the course inspectors. Mile by course, it's tightening up a little bit? Just a touch, yeah. So the jockey said by midway through the day yesterday they were they felt it was riding like soft yeah. ground. I think probably just a little bit loose on top because of that, that rain. How much um, rain did we have? Uh, three and a half mil. So, so not that much. You know, not it looked, that much. It, it wasn't no. very pleasant. But it wasn't really coming down no, that heavy. No, but it was it was sort of steady through the yeah. day, wasn't yeah. it? So um, so we just pulled it back a bit. We're going to call the um, Mild Bay Chase and Hurdle good to soft, good soft, good soft in places on the Grand National.
of course. We're, we're at sun's out, it feels really warm, and we're, we're still before 11 o'clock in the morning, so it's like sort of six, seven hours away from the big one. Could it go good to soft, the, the Grand National course? It might do, we'll keep an eye on it through the day. The, the soft ground really is sort of from Canal Turn, turn the usual. Right, which is always softer, and yeah. I'm not really sure how much that's going to realistically right. dry out. Um, and there's enough moisture that good to soft, it, it's going to stay there. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so. And, um, and we've not got that breeze that we had on Thursday. We have a fresh strip well. of ground on the. Ch- have we a fresh strip of ground on the hurdle track? Yes, chase and hurdle. Um, yeah. There's probably on average about five, six yards of fresh ground all the way around. So, puts rails on the innermost position. So right. we're distances as advertised. Right. Um, you had what? Fox hunters, maximum field, top of maximum field. We've just been down beaches uh, and having a look at the track. It's a credit, isn't it? You're- it is. Yeah. I mean, the team here are are fantastic. Um, led by Mark Ainsley, they they work tirelessly, and, and the you know the products there for everybody to see. Yeah, well, at five fifteen today, will you get a chance to really shout choreograph their honour? <laughs> Not really. I'll be I'll be worrying about other things. things. I usually find out who the winner is later on because I'm watching what's going on. Where do you watch else. it? I'm up uh, right up at the top of the stands, right. right up high. So I've got a view over everything. Um, as I say, conducting the orchestra, just making sure everything's going as it should be. Yeah, good stuff. It's went it's went great. Well, apart from the weather yesterday, but that's that's out of your hands, granted. Um, really enjoyed it. Looking for more of the same. Thanks for the updates. As we're going to head back now to the studio and say a very good morning to Tom Bull. Hi, Tom. Hi, Niall. Thanks very much indeed for that. Yes, welcome to the Racing TV studio. On this day of all days, one of my favourite afternoons in the racing calendar, Grand National Day. Can't wait for it all to get going. 39 horses, 30 fences, and of course, only one winner writing their name in the record books. But alongside the Grand National, a very good supporting card to look forward to as well. Three grade ones and two handicaps, plus a bumper at the end. But of course, it's all about that 515 and who will be crowned victor in their quest for champion glory. Right, let's have a look and see how the card looks for this afternoon's action at Aintree. And here is John Bond. We'll be taking on a few rivals in the opening race. The EFT Systems Maggle Novices Chase, won by some decent types in the past, including Duvan and Shishkin. So usually a pretty bright prospect comes to the fore in this contest. He is the odds-on favourites. Finished second in the Arkle, of course, last time out. And I'd to go one better. Likely to face his biggest challenge from not long till May. That is Hermes Allen. You might remember him absolutely sluicing to victory in the Challow Hurdle at Newbury. He goes in the Turner's Mersey Novices Hurdle, bidding to put behind him that underwhelming performance at the Cheltenham Festival in the Ballymore when he was sent off a pretty short price, but can never really get into it. However, the form of that Challow has worked out extremely well, with you where it's well, of course, winning the Mayor's Novice at the Cheltenham Festival. And Harry Cobden and Paul Nichols have already tasted glory this week already with Pick Dorhey, of course, a very nice winner of the Menning Chase yesterday afternoon. And one of the big races of the afternoon is the Liverpool Hurdle, which features plenty of stairs taking each other on, who ran in the stairs hurdle at the Cheltenham Festival, including, of course, last year's winner of the Liverpool Hurdle, Saadu Burle, looking for a rare double of both the stairs and the Liverpool Hurdle, having been successful at Cheltenham last time, as you can see there, seeing off Dashiell Drasher. He was a big price then, not such a big price today, although around about 7-1, to I think, still represents some value. And Dave Neverson will be on hand this afternoon to provide you with Grand National tips. A couple of his fancies ran in this race last year. I won't tell you what they are now. You have to wait for that. But um, he'll be on hand to provide you with his guidance once again. And Emmett Mullins is the trainer of the moment. He has been for the last couple of years, really. A real shrewd operator. He, of course, runs Noble Yates once again last year's winner. Looking to follow up. And he is in conversation a little bit later on with Gary O'Brien. And all things Grand National, we can't wait for it all to start. Some wonderful pictures, beautiful sunshine. It always seems to be sunny on Grand National afternoon, apart from, of course, that Red Marauder 2001 edition. But most of the time, lovely weather, and we do exactly that this afternoon. Plenty of analysis, plenty of punditry, and plenty of guidance to come throughout the afternoon and, indeed, throughout the morning as well. And apart from the Grand National, as I say, a very classy and competitive undercard to look forward to as well. Starting with that Maggle Novices chase over just shy of two miles, the 145. <clears throat> the 225 is next up. That's a, a premier handicap hurdle of three miles, 141 
nine yards, I should say, featuring a couple of uh, Cheltenham winners in there as well. The three o'clock is the Turner's Mersey Novices Hurdle, grade one over two and a half. Then the 335, that's the JRL Group Liverpool Hurdle, a grade one over the extended three miles. The 415, a premier handicap chase, the William Hill handicap chase, that's over the extended three miles as well. And then the big one, the blue ribboned events, the 515 Randox Grand National Handicap Chase over the extended four miles and two. And just over an hour after the Grand National is the final race at Aintree's Festival this year. The 620 is the Weatherby's NH Stallions.co.uk Standard Open National Hunt Flats Race, a grade two over the extended two miles featuring plenty of Irish challenges at short prices. And let's have a look at the non-runners this afternoon at Aintree. Just the two of them. Unsurprisingly, Banbridge, who won the manifesto earlier in the week, doesn't run in the 145. And the only non-runner in the Grand National is the 515 and number 16, Escaria 10. Right, time to return to the track at Aintree and rejoin Niall Hannity. And I've made my way down to Beecher's Brook, the famous uh, Beecher's Brook, on a glorious sunny morning, totally different from yesterday. Fence six, they'll take in the Grand National if you pan back up there. Uh, what a morning, what a view. And the track for all of the race done it in the Fox Hunters Thursday, the top of yesterday, still in fantastic shape. 39 horses, hopefully will be thundering down here just after 5.15 today with the news that Escaria 10 uh, is out of the National. And if you see, the, it's sort of taken a little bit of an angle. People say about the modifications. Yes, there is com compared to days gone by. But even jockey ships that are premium, because when you land over here, the next fence, Foy and Avon, comes up very quickly. And look at that bend. So if the drop's not as big down towards the inside, do you want to be forfeit and ground, jumping out here, and then really having to get that sort of handbrake round to get towards Foynhaven, land over Foynhaven, then you're doing a 90 degree to the canal turn. So this is the front of Beecher's Brook. A lot of people will ask once a year punters and people say, well, well, how do you know which one it is? How do jockeys know? Sometimes you'll see that, well, this is the only fence with the hedge, the famous hedge running down to Beecher's, gives you an indication. We were able to walk from the front of the fence to the back of the fence. Now, you, w you weren't able to do that in, in days gone by. You used to be, Beecher's ran right the way across, but it's nowadays there's, there's this gap, so if there is any loose horses, they can hopefully come round here, stay out of harm's way. The brook, it's still there, and uh, yeah, not as daunting maybe as in the past, but it still commands the utmost respect. At the, the, the top of them yesterday, the horses flew uh, out over this here, but I think it's really, you know, sometimes when you, you come down here, you don't really appreciate just how tight a way it is to to Foy and Avon. It was out here in years gone by where a lot of jockeys, you were searching for room and really hunting for the first circuit and playing jockeys in the second circuit. And it was about here where Ryman Reason back in 1988 all but fell, walked away from the fence. Surely his chance was gone, but we know that he went on to win it under, under Brendan Powell. So yeah, nowadays I always think of Paul Carby, Bobby Joe, right away down towards the inside. And I think there'll be less and less space down here because more and more prize money, better horses, uh, taking, the, the, taking the challenge off the Grand National and trying to save as much ground as possible. So you'll see here, it's not as much of a drop than there is here. So you've got to sort of balance and, and weigh it up, try and get a bit of room. Everybody, there's 39 of them walking just in for position and everybody trying to get that little bit of room. And it's lady luck, you need a slice of that, uh, that is for sure. We'll go right down towards the inside. I can hear the water running in underneath with the brook. And there we go, right down towards the inside. Fence six, fence 22 in the second circuit. Land over here and quickly gather up, get your momentum, spin round to Foy and Avon, 90 degree turn to the canal turn, Valentine's Brook, and then make your way home in the world's most famous steeplechase. Peter's Brook, really looking forward to it. Just after 5.15 today, hopefully 39 horses thundering down over here. Yes, thanks very much indeed, Niall. One of the most iconic fences, of course, in the Grand National. But the first race on the card is the Maggle Novices Chase and a chance once again to see John Bond, who was second in the Arkle last time out. He is a hot favourite for this contest, but I don't think he might necessarily have it all his own way because not long till May ran an absolutely fantastic race at the Cheltenham Festival last time out in the Turners. That was over two and a half miles. John Bond, of course, over two miles. Now, it would be folly to do a direct comparison between the two because, of course, they were on different tracks, on different ground and over different distances as well. But I did want to draw attention to the fact that both John Bon and Not Long Till May travelled very well to a certain point in their respective races. In the end, of course, both finished second behind impressive winners. 
But what I really wanted to point out was the fact that not long till May must have a very good chance indeed of toppling John Bond this afternoon. I think if he was trained by a more fashionable handler, perhaps he'd be a shorter price than he currently is. But as you can see at this point in the turn, as not long till May coming up to the second last and takes the lead ahead of stage star. I think in the end, excess stamina and probably a, a very good ride from Harry Cobden on the far side won the race for stage star but no doubt not long till May had the race been over slightly shorter would have had every chance of battling off stage star and I think this drop-in trip is going to be absolutely vital for him and as we can see John Bon at the top there behind El Fabiolo I think El Fabiolo yes we know he's a very talented horse in his own right but we know that John Bon now has his limitations he looked a little bit wayward at Warwick before that and then he was well put in his place there by El Fabiolo wasn't he so I think not long till May represents definite value in that contest this afternoon to see off John Bon. How does the betting look for that race, though? Let's have a look at this. John Bon is 4-11, to 11, a very hot favourite with Skybet. And not long till May, next in at 9-2 for Adam Wedge. Marvel de Cerisi, 10-1 to 1, Rachel Blackmore. Calico at 16, renewing rivalry, of course, with John Bon. And Fusey in the outsider for Patrick Neville and Brian Hughes, 28-1. to 1. John Bon, though, 4-11 to 11 to get the job done. But I think 9-2 does represent some value. Right, though, let's see what the real experts think with Tom at the track. Tom, I do think that uh, not long till May might have a chance of toppling John Bond. What do you guys think? Well, it's, it's an interesting angle, of course, with not long till May back in distance. Um, we'll answer that question by having a closer look at the, at the individual races. So, um, John Bond, first of all, Mark, for your money, was he, was he just beaten by a better horse in the arc or having done everything right or did, did something in the race lead into his defeat do you think? I, I don't think the tacky ground by all accounts suited him I don't think that or that sorry meant we didn't see him at his absolute best but at the same time I would always back El Fabiolo to beat him every time they, they met certainly in, in the future I think the winner's an exceptional horse in, in his own right John Bond came off the bridle now he, he keeps on well enough but he, he's just no match in the end Dysart Dynamo unfortunately we, we lose him late on so I think the ground slightly impeded on his on his performance, but this does look a, goal, a good opportunity for him today. Two miles, we know he's a specialist two miles. I think the talk after the race was for him to come here for the manifesto over two and a half, but obviously JP also had to say, wow, he's looked, at, he's looked at the race, he looks an easier opportunity, and he probably justifies that price. Just on that, do you think John Bond is or would be just as effective over further, or, or for you, is he an out-and-out two-miler? Um, I think he... The more he runs, the more I think that two and a half wouldn't be a problem. But I think his form at two miles is just so much better than these that it probably wouldn't matter anyway. I mean, you, you're, you're slightly in the dark with Cheltenham novices at the time. You have a fair guide of where you think you stand with them. But then as more evidence emerges for the remainder of Cheltenham and also for Aintree, as we've seen the first couple of days, you get a clear picture as to which of the, the premier novice races in terms of strength of form. And, this week we've seen not long till May's Turner's let down by stage star and we've seen Samwa, well held third in the Arkle, go very close to beating Bambridge who skipped Cheltenham on the opening day. So uh, for me there's there's a, a sizable gap between the two in terms of that two mile division being maybe 10 or 12 pounds better than the mid-rangers. Okay, do you take Tom's point that not long till May will be suited by a drop in trip? I think the trip's fine. My, my reading of that race was it was a slowly run affair, an unusually slowly run affair for Cheltenham. Harry Cobden essentially got to control it as he pleased. And being Cobden, I think he just, he probably looked to his right and thought, well, it's, it's not long till May. I know he's about 50 to 1. I've still got him covered. I think not long till May, if anything, caught a couple napping by committing as he did. Now, he's a very good horse and he's earned his stripes in lesser quality races when in the likes of Musselboro when it was a smallish field and not very competitive but he did prove here that he's a very useful novice I mean he would have said at the start of the season that he'd be finishing out of the likes of Appreciate It and Mighty Potter he just wouldn't have done but still I thought, I've got a firm belief that that two and a half mile novice farm just isn't in the same league as the two milers Yeah I, I think I think there's an element of David Russell and, and Paul Townend on the day watching each other yeah. um, they're, they're both far enough back and I think 
I heard Willie Mullins interviewed the other day, he more or less indicated that Harry Cobden got away with murder out in front. He got too soft at the time out of it in front. The Irish horses, the, the so-called big guns, were watching each other. They let Stage Star get on with things. But, you know, not, not long to May, as Dan said, he, he's done very well. He's gone up £32 this season. Back to two miles, I don't think it'll be a problem. He's one round muscle, but he's one round weather bid, so the sharp track's going to suit him. But how will they ride him? I assume they'll ride him aggressively, bearing in mind he's back in trip. But you've also got Calico, he got for saying, for saying that they're all front runners. So the, the way the race is run, it's going to be absolutely perfect, isn't it? Yeah, for John Bond? I think John Bond really, in an ideal world, would be ridden patiently. I mean, he, he blew his brains out going with Dysart Dynamo in the Supreme last season. I do think there was an element of that in the article. I do agree that El Fabiolo is a better horse and a better prospect, but I think the gap might be a bit narrower than it appears on that bare form because of that, that John Bond was, he was having a crack at Dysart Dynamo a fair way out. I mean, if it, slightly more patience. Aidan Coleman said to me as well at Mark saying that he didn't think he was as effective jumping-wise with the ground as it was. That's, that's, that's what's by the by if you're judging it from a form perspective. But, um, yeah, that, that's, that's my reading of the race, that A, the two-mile form is better, and B, John Bond... They might work out today that actually patient tactics is, is the way to go with him. Uh, Marble de Cerisi was also a runner at, at Cheltenham, albeit in a very different type of contest, and, and well held on this occasion as well, 11 and a half legs behind behind said and of course he's got Mark quite, quite a bit to find on official figures. He has, well, yeah. How, how do you rate his chances, it, it, even even if you take John Bon out of it, is, has he still got to find something to finish ahead of not long to May? I, I think he has on, on the form behind Hador on, on his penultimate start, but he's, I can see why he's running because Henry de Bromhead's got a very good race, a very good record in the race. It's almost as though he wanted to have a runner in the race and the, there's opportunity to pick up the prize money. But um, the, the way the race will be run, I'm sure John Bond in time will get two and a half. He's, he's a full brother to um, Duvan, isn't he? He won over two and a half, he won a Con Mel Oil. So equally affected, two, two, two and a half. I just think he's the class act of the race, as the betting suggests. Uh, your view on Marvel? Yeah, I quite like him. To be honest, at those prices, if you say, which one would you back to finish second or in a forecast? I think I would go with him. I like the idea that he's going to get a patient ride, which might be the way to go in this race. And I've still got in my mind the fact that he was giving impervious a bit of a race earlier in the season. Yeah, maybe he didn't come up to scratch at Cheltenham, but that was a race dominated by horses that were handy, and he wasn't so. So... That was off a break as well. We've not seen him for three months. Henry's already had winners this week, as he did at Cheltenham. And yeah, I'd be hopeful that he's not as full on. I hope to finish second as the betting would have you believe. Just sum up John Bum for us, if you can, Mark. Taking into account what happened at Warwick as well, is he fundamentally? Are we looking at the end of the season now uh, of this chase season? With, it, with a, an element of disappointment as to what might have been, or, or do you think he's achieved everything he could have? I, th I think if you took the first two performances, Warwick first time out was very good when he beat Monry Rowell, and he was very, very good at Sandown, yeah. wasn't he, Henry? So in the context of those two performances, yes, you'd be a bit disappointed. Warwick, the second run at Warwick is the mystery run. Well, by all accounts, he needed the run. There was an excuse, and it, to a degree, put it behind him in the arcle. But that was just a very funny race, wasn't it? I, I, I don't know how you explain that performance, but... Overall, yes, he will be a touch disappointed. Yeah, it was a slightly weird. I do think what that Warwick race did with the re-opposing Calico, it reflected really well on Harry Skelton. I think it was, it was completely cat and mouse. There's only two in it, and he thought, right, well, I'm going to try and commit here and put John Bond on the back foot. I think it was made to look a bit worse than it maybe was. The disappointment for me was that he didn't really power away once he got to him in the straight albeit fair play to Calico he's come out and done something I didn't think he'd do he, he, he got the better of pay the piper in a slugfest of a finish if you'd have, I'd have been betting that race in running I'd, I wouldn't have been able to get enough on pay the piper because I just thought he'd find more than him so um, perhaps that Calico form isn't like the red herring that it might might appear ok summation anyone wanting a bet just a watching brief for you no if there was anything it would be a forecast with him to be Marvel to Seriously Mark just watch him I think he'll win ok Let's head out to find Niall Hamity. We've seen Beatrice Brook. Let's have a look at Canal Turn. Fence 8. Um, we, we can pan round. You see Foyan Avon. So again, you jump Foyan Avon down to the Canal Turn. 90 degree angle once they land over here. And I mentioned about the class of the horse. Like Neptune Colonge winning in this race. It was a 2012. He was third behind Corda Star and Denman in a vintage school cup. That's the sort of class of horse you get nowadays. So do you really want to be forfeit and grind? The prize money's up, etc, etc. So many horses in the handicap. So many horses in with a chance. Do you want to be jumping it out here and ending up over here as you swing around to that next playing fence? The answer is no. At Beecher's Brook, you can lose a lot of ground. Canal Turn, you can lose uh, even more. So... 
while maybe back in the day you would have talked about horsemanship for a circuit, I think it's more jockeyship nowadays and, and sort of stealing the length here and there because it's, it's a tightly compressed handicap. It's a lot of quality horses these days. So again, it'll be down towards the inside. You might remember Paddy's return years ago was at Red Marauders National. He ran across this fence and, and hampered and wiped out a, a, a few horses who, who were out of the race effectively. They've done a couple of things. If we can just pan there, if the loose horse can... If a loose horse does come down here, they can run into that chute where they're safe. There's people, there's outriders in there to catch him. And also, if they're loose before they get to the canal turn, if they come out this way, if they run out, naturally, they just end up going in this chute here, into that pen, where once again there's people to catch them straight away. So they're out of harm's way and they're safe themselves. And pan up, you'll see where all the commentators going all around the world. You'll hear one commentator handing over to whoever is down this section of the track and they can lie easily with each other. Maybe if somebody missed a, an early faller, they can speak to each other on the way around and, and try and help mop up what has happened so far in the race and, and keep an eye on the fancied horses and keep an eye on all 39 of them. But yeah, it's a really good shot. Jump the canal turn, second time around, and then it really is starting to, to hot up. Another playing fence, Valentine's, and back towards home in the most famous jump race in the world. Thanks very much indeed to Niall. Plenty more to come from him a little bit later on on the flush and verdant turf of the Grand National Course. But in the meantime, horse welfare has been very much to the fore this week in all the news. And one aspect, one innovation that's been so good over the last few years is the retraining of racehorses. And a handicapper who had a bit of class back in the day is first Fandango. So let's see what he's been up to in life after racing. <laughs> So Freddie at uh, First Fandango, he came to me five years ago. Um, I actually had his full brother, so I hunted him down and I asked the trainer very nicely, Tim Vaughan, if I could have him when he was finished. And yes, he came to me two months after his last race. And um, here he is. <laughs> he does have his quirks, you can't tie him up. Uh, he spooks at a pole on the floor. but. Normally very straightforward, uh, very willing, very loving, just an absolute legend, yeah. He had an eight year racing career, he ran a total of 50 times and in that he won seven, winning 69,000 and he ran at four Chatham festivals in a row. He ran as a two-year-old right through to a three-mile chaser, so he has done everything. He had actually had three months off just for a bit of downtime, let his body change shape, and then we started very slowly telling me what he wanted to do, really. If he didn't want to show, that was fine. Actually, he started off hunting, and then from then on, he's literally won, I think, every competition, not every competition, but every style of competition that he's won. Um, dressage, jumping, cross country, I think it's his attitude to life. Uh, he just gives everything a go. There is nothing he won't say no to. He's just so loving. Uh, every morning you walk into the barn, he's the first to talk to you down the field. He'll call to you. Not necessarily come over, but he'll say that he's ready to come in. You know, he, you just know he loves you. I don't necessarily say it's the wins I'm proud of him. I'm just proud of him all round, um, just because he is a legend. I don't ever worry about what he's going to do. I don't worry about anything. My little boy, he would come and get him in, he'd sit on him. So I'm just proud of him. He has a very variety of life. Um, he'd school one day a week, go out jumping, go across the common. He just has one day off a week and fits in. From winning show jumping on Saturday to winning a top class show class on the Sunday to then, you know, teaching my little boy on the Monday. He just, there's nothing he can't do. Is there anyone more versatile than Freddie, really?
Yeah, great scenes there with first Fandango. Still finishing first, even though his racing career has ended. Right, let's get back to entry action. We'll talk about the first handicap on the car, which is the 225. Fiendishly competitive for the Village Hotel's handicap hurdle. A premier handicap over the extended three miles. West Balboa is one of 22 who go to post for this. 9-2 to two for Harry and Dan Skelton. Very unexposed, got to have a big chance, the seven-year-old. Mexico next in, 6-1 to one for Kieran Gethings and Stuart Edmonds. And then, good time, Johnny. A winner, of course, of the Potemps at the Cheltenham Festival. Liam McKenna gave him a fantastic ride. Can he repeat the dose? 13-2. to two. And Tayor, 10-1, to one, alongside outlaw Peter. Party business, then 11-1. to one, Former winner of this race, of course. Henry's friend at 11s. Mill Green, 12-1. to one, Van very well at Cheltenham as well. Eau Fleurant is 12-1. to one. Gatsby Gray, 14s. Vina Ardanza, 18-1. to one. Moon Hunter is 18 to 1. Bardenstown Lad is 22 to 1. 28 to 1 and bigger the rest. Right, a nice, easy, simple puzzle for you to try and work out, Tom, Mark, and Dan. I know that Dan's got quite a strong fancy in this. Yeah, Dan thinks it's easy. He's not even fab. He's not even second fab, which I think is absolute madness. Yeah, I mean, uh, what he did at Cheltenham was something that you... I could probably count on one hand the number of times I've seen a horse make a, a surge like that. Actually, Strong Lady yesterday did it in the <laughs> two-mile novice. We were liking that to sort of what's up boys snatching the Coral Cup from out of the fire years ago. And there was a, absolutely no right to finish in the first handful, let alone win the race. It was dominated... I mean, he had 19 ahead of him at the second last. As we see him crossing the last and still working for him, he's not even getting a clear run. He hadn't jumped great. He made a mistake at the top of the hill. Even at this point, he's got eight or nine ahead of him. And I think if you were going to say one part of the track was an advantage over the other during Cheltenham week, I don't think it was the inside of the hurdles track. Not even in the first five crossing the last thing, say he's eighth or ninth. And he ends up winning by three and three quarter lengths. It was a staggering display. And because so much went against him, he ended up winning by a margin that meant the handicapper could put him up just five pounds, really. So, yeah, I, I think if he's in the same form, he's going to take an awful lot of eating. Do you see this test, this track, being a positive and negative compared to Cheltenham? I, ironically, the, the reason I didn't fancy him at Cheltenham was because he, dis for me, disappointed on, I think it was three occasions beforehand, to me, he did look a flat track horse. So the fact he could do that at Cheltenham, there's every indication he could be even better. He's up five pounds for today. 12 Stone in theory is obviously a very big weight, especially if he's still testing ground, but Liam McKenna's taking his five, that's going to be a big hole. He had a hard race, didn't he? To finish. Can you have a hard race when you finish in that strong? It was just a remarkable display, and the re in Mill Green, he was third in that race last year before finishing third in this. He's likely to run really well again, but if you were to take a match bet, for instance, between those two, I mean, you'd say that Mill Green would never possibly be good time, Johnny. I thought he was a fairly freak his performance. Just look at his overall profile. He made a lot of promising progress last season in handicaps. He won back-to-back -back races in big fields. They then overfaced him probably. They ran him in graded races at the spring festivals. That didn't work. Then he's tried chasing. So I think you can sort of carve out three or four runs there and ignore them. And if you judge him on his overall profile, that freak show at Cheltenham wasn't actually that surprising given that he was a progressive horse not that long ago. OK, West Burr went up the same amount, £5, for his short-head defeat of Red Risk in the Lanzarote, Mark. Do, do, the, do those two rises equate for you? Um, probably, the, you, you think your good time, Johnny, has got off lighter of, of the pair, really, just the fact he's one of the Cheltenham Festival. At the same time, West Bilbauer, this was a Lanzarote hurdle. It was a funny race that there weren't... How many finishes were there? There weren't many, were there? 20 set off and four yeah, finishes. That's right, yeah, I was going to say. There, there certainly weren't many finishes, so it was a, it was a really gru uh, gruelling race. Um, the positive to her chance, she, she's obviously been kept back for this. She's been off since the middle of January. She's only had four starts over hurdles. She coats well with ease in the ground. She goes three miles for the first time, which I think on pedigree, you should be pretty hopeful she will stay that, um, stay that trip. You know, she's still unexposed and she could have well improved for going three miles. Dan Skelton's obviously set aside a fair number of horses to come here fresh. It hasn't really gone to plan so far. He hasn't had a great deal of luck, so mm. hopefully this mare can book the trend. Yeah, you, the the background to that race sort of speaks for itself, doesn't it? If 20 are setting out and 16 of them aren't finishing through exhaustion, 
the fact that she was still going strongly enough to win the race, I'd, I'd like Mark would have no doubt that she'll stay the trip. I mean, she, she might improve from it, and she's still rated in the high 120s. I mean, it's a long mark for a, a mare with the reputation she's got, but she likes she's a race, Johnny. Yeah, she'd like the race, but I see what you're getting at with the respective rises. It's a it's a race I would not want it to have had to handicap that Lanzarote. What do you mm. do? Do you take the do you take the view that the first four were exceptionally well handicapped because they were only ones who cope with it? I think I'd have been more cautious, and I think five's probably about right. It's, you, it could be ten. It could have been three. I mean, it, it was hard to say. Yeah, the horse fight. Was it Harbour Lake? I don't. I don't think he he, did, he ran in that, didn't he? Yeah. He, did, he didn't fight. He came out and ran well yesterday. Yeah, didn't he? definitely. So, yeah, there were some good horses. Didn't perform that day. Yeah, Outlaw Peter's one since yeah, he was right, legless. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, let's have a look at Outlaw Peter, who has got up five pound for, <laughs> for that win last is that time. It's an automated I, system. So that's, that's just how it works. Yeah. If, you, if you're running in this race, you got five pound. <laughs> um, this was obviously much more recent than than the West Balboa. Um, uh, again, another very lightly raced horse. Yeah, he's, he's a. I saw him at Muscle Brewer in the campaign where he got just touched off by Anishaya of Lucinda Russell's, and he still looked a bit raw and and not ungainly, but you know, still learning his craft. I think this was a much more polished display. This was the Saturday, wasn't it, of Cheltenham Week, so it's Kempton's the consolation card, as yeah. it used to be referred yeah. to. And there wasn't really many moments on the way around where he didn't look like he was going to be a big player, and then I think later on it was clear that he was going to win decisively. So. You respect him. I don't think we've seen the best of him yet. As I say, we're still learning. Still want to be learning two or three runs ago. Yeah, just going back up in trip, the, the run that Dan's referred to at Muscle, but that was over three miles, and you could argue Lucinda Russell's horse outstayed him. But I think you've got to take into account he had such a hard race at, at Kempton in the Lanzarote. That was only three weeks later, I think it yeah. was. So you probably didn't see him at his very best. You can see why they're having another go at three miles today. He's been doing his stuff over intermediate trips, but. You know, today I'll tell them more for next season what they're going to do with him. OK, last year's winner, other horses in the race. Where do you want to go, Dan? I'll give Mexico a mention okay. because yeah. he's got entry form and you look back at... He kept running the same race, really, over two and a half and they upped him in distance to three at Utoxeter and the race was his at every stage. He just tagged through the race. So he's got some untapped potential as a stayer, but, yeah, I'm, uh, you know where I where my loyalties lie here. Indeed. Any others? When you're uh, just, just carry on with Mexico. He was very good at Utoxies the last time. And Stuart Edmonds' horses are in, they're in very, as good a form now as they have been all season. You and they run well here. They do run well here, yeah, absolutely. In fact, he, I think he won Hometown this race, didn't he? Hometown boy won, yeah, he won, won he, a he won, division he won this race, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. He won this few years. Last year's winner, Party Business. I think he's only, he's only yeah. five pound higher, isn't he? Yeah, it must be must be the in thing. Yeah. He's five pound higher than when he won the yeah. race last when he won the race last year. <laughs> With a circuit to run in last year's race, he looked as though he had no yeah, chance. It was a million, didn't, didn't he? Having, having run well in the Martin Pipe, so you'd, you'd respect him because he's had a light campaign. He's only had three runs this season. O'Fleur on blinkers on. Surely up and trips going to suit. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I'm never a big fan of the combo at the same time. I'd rather try one before the other because sometimes they could be a bit lit up and not stay. And um, on the party business farm, I'm not, it, referee and Williams had only three winners this over jumps this calendar year which is which isn't up to his usual standards but last year was a striking performance Mark Howard who do you fancy? I, I find it a, an absolutely horrible race in terms of trying to get the win I'll, I'll go with party business to, to come back just the entry factor but I don't have a strong opinion at all I'll leave that well, to Yeah, well, we, that, you know frankly we're here for strong opinions aren't we Mark yeah, I mean, it's just well, un I, I've been concentrating on the Grand National and <laughs> this weather change has thrown <laughs> out the window we, uh, we know Tom who Dan Barber fancies we do indeed, yes. Will it be good time, Johnny, for good time, Danny? We shall see a little bit later on. But there he is, the Potemps winner. Very emphatic victor, wasn't he? Staying on extremely stoutly and strongly ahead of all the other 22 rivals in that race to land the spoils under a well-timed ride from the rear from Liam McKenna. Hadn't really been in too much form before that. Had good time, Johnny. But as is his want, Tony Martin produced him perfectly to win that handicap at Cheltenham. And once again, he's pretty uh, short price in the market for this one. And is the selection of Dan Barber, indeed the nap this afternoon at Aintree. Right, let's get back to the course and rejoin Niall Hannity. OK, it's time to catch up with Michael Shinner from Skybet and talk all things betting, um, Grand National and the other races, because it, it's a really good card, like the last few days. Yeah, really good card now, loads of quality, um, some really competitive handicaps as you would expect. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. Results, um, I think they went the punter's way uh, on the Thursday, 
probably more so the bookmakers Friday. Today we'll see how it goes, but obviously everything will pale into insignificance because the Grand National is mm. the biggest betting race of the whole year. Mm. Uh, what is Skybet doing to try and draw them one year, once a year customers in? Seven places, right. Niall. Um, a couple of horses have been backed at bigger prices. Uh, Velvet Elvis has right. been backed um, into around about 28s from 40s. And uh, the other horse that's been backed, and a good start because I've already forgotten its name, is Roi, Roi Marge. Right, the uh, Griffin team. Yes, uh, 22 from 40 to one, really well supported. Um, it's in around, some winning colours, Aurora on course colours. Exactly, yep. Yeah. And we're nine in the field, Corak Rambler, Delta Work, ain't that a shame. Um, but yeah, it looks, it look, you know, you, you're looking sort of two or three weeks ago where it was like six the field and it, it was fairly apparent that, you know, bookmakers want to try and get as much business as they can. It's nine to one the field now. And it'll be interesting to see what goes off favourite because there's a number of horses hovering around that nine, ten, eleven to one mark who could well go off favourite. I'd be surprised if Rachel Blackmore's didn't go off favourite. That was my next thing I was going to say. You know, with Manella Times, etc., what Rachel's done the last few years in the sport, that'll all, that'll all add up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you have to remember, it's not, you know, it's not just your racing TV customers who will be betting in, in the race like the Grand National. It spreads across a wide variety of people and, and they look at horses' names. The big dog has been really well supported. Um, and have he's you ever one seen of our... Nurture? No. Harry Nurture? Snoopy? No. No. Massive. Is he? He's only two years of age, so I want to keep him on side. Still growing? Hopefully not, because you'd have to live in the stable outside. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. Uh, are you backing that then on the back of? Might do, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, and then you'll be backing Mr. Incredible as well, yeah, after, yeah. named after yourself. Well, no, I was going to say work with Martin Dixon. Yeah, and Chris. Yeah, well, Martin. Well, okay. Um, yeah, those two have been supported. Um, uh, yeah, the big dog, Mr. Incredible, and then there's there's another couple of horses that have been backed. Uh, Mr. Coffee, we've seen money for that, and the Dick worst. Anderson. Trainer. Yes, yes. Pretty well international. He's won everything else. Never won uh, yeah, a horse ran well. Uh, his mare ran well in the top him yesterday. Yes, second. Um, but yes, yeah, so we'll see. And then the worst result, the the worst result we've got in the book. And I'm not saying that it's because we've laid loads for it, but at the prices and on the name, is a horse that is basically you, which is back on the lash. Um, and that is the worst result that we have um, in our book. We haven't particularly shortened the price of it, but we just keep laying bets on it purely because of the name. I would suspect. I'd be surprised. Yeah, but good name. Good name. Yeah. Um, what else? Away from the Rand Extra National? Yeah, uh, seven places now in the big uh, handicap hurdle. Uh, West Bilboa has been well supported, 92 from 7 to 1. Dart Ravens being backed, ran well at uh, Cheltenham, 100 to 30 from 4. Uh, and then a couple of uh, horses bound to greatness in the race before the National were paying five places, 14 from 25. And Blizzard of Oz, not so much today, but was well back yesterday evening, 6 to 1 from 8 to 1. Uh, Willie Mullins hoping to get a, a winner of the bumper with Patrick taking the ride. Bound to greatness, apparently a lot of money around the Norwich area because obviously they had a bout of greatness last night I don't know if they watched the football I, I didn't watch it now but I believe they given an exhibition I think it was called I, be I believe your team uh, did the business yeah you're, um, you're, you're striding towards the Skybet EFL playoffs yeah. and um, no doubt I'll be getting a phone call from you looking for um, a little bit of um, a few tickets and a bit of hospitality I the Skybet so. championships wide open exactly. just like the, the Rand Extra National exactly. right where are we Horse and groom. We're in the horse and groom. Not yeah. horse and jockey. It was horse and jockey last year. I believe so. It's a horse and groom. Times are changing. Yeah, um, it's it's a very very nice facility. I dare Can say we see it's where expensive. we are? Obviously, if you're up in the horse and groom, you're going to get a good old view of the the winner of the national. About half five this evening. Let's head in. And so he's in here. It will be our dear friend, the wine tipster, no doubt. Look at this here. I've never been up. Were you up here last year? Uh, no, I've never. Oh. I've never been here before. Oh. You're scared of heights. And here he is. How are you doing? I'm great. Happy now. Grand National Day. Happy and Grand to you. And Do you know Michael? Shit. Yeah, I know Michael. Of course I do. Michael. Oh, I Michael. Michael. Oh, Michael. Welcome. Come on. <laughs> Where guys. are we? Where are we? We're in the horse and groom. First year we've had the horse and groom experience here at Aintree. Let's just have a little walk down here now because we'll come back to some wonderful food here. Richard Pickman on the TV. Rich, Rich, about Rich, Fifty yeah. years ago. Fifty. Years, amazing. Fifty years ago. So influential. Brilliant interview. That. Great, all inspired us all to love the Grand National, Rummy, and everything else there. Old oh, come on. And There's here, just to give the whole sort of pub feel here, nice and cosy, silks, lots of artists and craft beers, which I know you'll like now. Shinners, you love your beers, don't you? Uh, th th this, yes, I do, <laughs> to be perfect. I, I, I like a beer, not as much as I likes a beer, but I like a beer. <laughs> not many people like a beer as much as me. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll keep just going a bit, because we can just have a, just pan out, we've just got the whole pub feel here. It's, it's a bit like this in Cheltenham, it's not the same people. It's, it's, the same, it's the same place. Right. So we I took, we're very successful at Cheltenham. I'm sure I, I knew I recognised that yeah, water yeah, can. You, 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 <laughs> 
You've been here before. Yeah. You've done so it didn't tell. need it after yesterday. <laughs> yeah. She didn't need it. <laughs> They've been there at all. But we're fully booked here today, so guests are starting to arrive. Randolph's Grand National Day, but it's a really, really nice feel to it. It's really great. Yeah. And just pan across there because then you've got guests have got a great view of the parade. Well, we're just, just we're just got a view. We were speaking to Michael about yeah, what's going to win great. the national. <laughs> Who's um, going to win the national? I don't know. Deep breath. Michael. Delta Winter. work. Delta work. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to have a chat. The ground won't be that bad at, at five fifteen. I don't think it will. Come no. on, it's getting warm out there. So, I th guys, I'd like to look after you. Come on, get the pub experience. We're oh, going in. We're, we're going, going to in, go in. Yeah, we're going to do that. What have we got? So oh, here we go. Why? Yeah, come on. Look, wow. we've got this lovely menu here. Lee Miller, the head chef here, ain't How come I've got the dessert? I mean, they don't use these, these arancini balls. This is your star. Why oh, is that not custard? <laughs> That's oh. an almond sauce. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what is it? And that's an almond sauce. You've got some pickled cabbage there, and you've got your own chili. You need to have I'll a chair. Oh, right. Come on, you have I'll a share. Come on there. Right. Thought you like a burger now. So we've got that for you. We've got these lovely right. cackle green eggs there, and you've got yourself... There's the, a muffin underneath. Yeah, muffin as well, and you've got your beef brisket. Right. Come on, boys. Do and I I've just, got this salmon I, here as well. Do I just go a whole bowl in my mouth? Come on, go in, go yeah, in, go some in. Bacon. Here, no, how about when you're starting? Come on. Share, we're friends. But how do you eat that? Well... You guys have fought here, come on, you can do it. Have some fries oh, as well. Right, right I've actually oh. gone for the salmon option here. But, by the way, you need to taste those eggs as well. They're absolutely fantastic. But this is the What's whole pub. We've got, the, we've got the madri there. I've got some red this wine for you as well. This is not my first madri of the week. It's not my first madri of the <laughs> no. week. 50 years since Red Rum won. <laughs> have you had under or over 50 madris this week? <laughs> um, probably just over. Okay. <laughs> but not, not, no, no, not no. by many. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Cheers. To red going in. To red rum. Cheers. To red rum. <laughs> what, what's he, what's he drinking? He's got the Atlantic Pale Ale there. Lovely, oh. nice Pale Ale. has got so popular now. And we've got a really nice red wine here from Spain, Bodegas Care as well. You might be surprised to know it, Michael, but I'm not mad in the salad, so you can have that too. <laughs> Cheers, no. Thank you. So we got, it's great what, do you, what have you got? Yeah. Well, I've, got I've, I've gone for the salmon. No, we've got this little salmon pate here, so I've gone there on that one. And also, I've got my little sweet. Sweet and sour relish there as well. Right. You know, want to have a taste of that now? But also, just to give a pub feel as well. What do you think? Sinners enjoying the food? Perfect, foods? beautiful. Yeah? Very Absolutely nice. Absolutely beautiful. So we want to get the whole pub piece. It's great. Now, who's going to be talked about Delta work? Yeah, yeah. Sinners? Well, he's going to about... Come on, you have another round of I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk yeah. about the Milos. Capadano. You, you, you Capadano, about... if he's jumping, I think he's still a very good horse. Yeah. His profile, but if anyone can do it, Willie Mullins. Tell to work. I was thinking last night when the rain was coming down or yesterday afternoon, but what about you? Well, I'm a Lamilos fan. I think, look, the, I, tell I you don't what, fancy Lamilos. I don't fancy him. Why not? Why not? Um, I just don't. Well, can you give me something else rather than why not? Why not? I just don't. Okay, there's a great <laughs> what do you What do you think the ground will be come quarter past five? No. no. Oh, well, we we'll just booked this. Um, so they can, the, the clock of the course, that you come off the track and the mild maze now good, the soft, the soft places have got out of it. Okay. It's warm. Come on, we got not just because we climbed them steps. And yeah, lack of sleep. Yeah, it is warm. <laughs> so I'm thinking they're good ground right, national. Um, oh, sorry, good to soft. Yeah, good, good to soft. soft. Okay. We're going to be good to soft then. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm with Neil. I, I'm with some, I like the no, meat loss as well. This is it. You're not do you? Yeah, I do. I don't. It's done. I do. He's going to like the ground. Come on. Won the coral trophy. Yeah, I do. I like it. I think he's got a great chance. What's this? Um, what's this sauce? So you got an almond sauce there. Okay. Nice. It's almond. <laughs> you don't like almonds? I'm not intolerant. <laughs> Are you? No, I'm not. Yeah, sure. Can we get him a chair? <laughs> well, it's very nice. I'll tell you what, a food, a food program beckons. <laughs> I'll tell you. Right, well, come it's on. It's very nice. Well, yeah, have a taste of good. this. Come on. You can have some pate as well. Do you like pate? Yeah, yeah, come yeah. On, let's you get pate and leaves. Um, we we get go. paint and leaves. Here, here, here. Here we go. Come on. What are you drinking? I'm not, I'm not being funny, but <laughs> mine looks nicer. It's not a great head in that. Oh, that's, that was, you know, I was waiting for you, actually. That's why. It's not my fault. Yeah, it's my fault. It's my fault. We had that's already. Right. Yeah, he's happy there. That's a good one, though. And you need to have a what taste. Is that, is that the same? Is that the same as no. Yeah, I've got the same. She doesn't know. Because we've got the same selection in the Grand National. What yeah. was it? Guys, you can have a taste of the red wine as well. Because that's... Uh, no, I'm no, I am no expert. <laughs> no rush. <laughs> There's no rush, no. Can I taste it? So what's it? Can I just ask you a question, Neil? Because I've mm. seen this on... What, how do you do it, then? 
Oh, right, let's have a little piece here. Yeah, let's have a little piece here. Yeah, let's have a little piece here. Come on, let's have a little piece here. No, first of all, hold on. Let's just hold the glass by the stem. Come on. Why? Because what you want to do first of all is just look at the appearance of the wine. Because the wine should always look fresh and fresh and bright, never dull. Even a, I had a red somewhere recently, it looked really dull, which is a signal there's something wrong with the wine. No, right. Okay, and then what you need to do, the glasses get... are quite full. So good technique, Shinners, I like it. Thank Keep you. going. Now, what you've got to do is get your nose in. The reason you do that is not to be fancy and pretentious. Sometimes lots of wines are in screw cap now, sometimes they're in cork. Sometimes you get a bit of cork too. So wine should smell really fresh. If it ever smells as a damp cardboard, there's a tip for you now, uh, that is the time to actually just say, oh, I need to just send this back very yeah. polite. And have a taste. They've got to make a bit of a sound now. You do that. Look, have another go. You do that. You do that. <laughs> Go on, shooters, you've got to do this. See it off. Get the air onto your palate. Come on, let's have a bit. Get air onto your palate. <laughs> Get a strip on your esophagus. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, I'll tell you what, nice. you, I tell you what, Shinnis, you've just passed the Wine and Spirit Education well, give, Trust give the, exams there. Give it, go on, make the noise. Come on. No, that's good, that's good. Holding it by no, the you're going to hold it by the stem. Hold it by the stem. I don't know why, but I'm a bit nervous today. <laughs> <laughs> Have a thing and then make that look. Come on, you can do it. Yeah, that's it. He's doing well, though. You get Gaviskin for dessert, no? <laughs> it's not like a dolphin. <laughs> There we go, boys. Right. That's how you do it. Go on, give it that. What about the big dog? We're backing that because I've got a big dog, Snoopy. Good chance. Come on. Got to be right in the mix. Got good handicap form, hasn't it? Yeah, really, but really... he went up a lot. Obviously, he won the Troy to win chase, but I don't know. Come, actually, Chinas, just before you have another Aaron Chini ball, outside of Lamilos, who yeah. else are you going for? Come on. Um... I think Velvet Elvis. I think it's inter an interesting horse. I think not far behind... Um, any... Neymar. Well, no, not far behind any second now. Right. I get any second. I have a massive chance. Yeah. Oh, you, look, look, there seems to be momentum now. Everybody seems to be coming back to any, any second. Well, yeah. now. It's a compressed handicap. Yeah. He argued he comes into the race in better form than he did 12 months ago. Yeah. Um, and he ran into the best handicap Grand yeah. National winner for years and years. Yes. Nobody is. But he's back. We haven't even mentioned him. That's true. That's true. But I mean, I just, he's got so much more weight What's though, happened? hasn't he? Come on. You all right? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to taste some wine as well. I've just bought the whole ball and I'm out. The whole ball. The whole ball. <laughs> But what about Galliard de Menil? No yeah, one mentioned that horse. Well, I did. That was well, my first one to mention when it came in. Right, okay. Listen. Well, he, he's my number one then. Okay. Another seven year old, but maybe that's not. Willie Mons can do it. Willie Mons can do it. It's interesting enough, it's his tenth chase start as well. You haven't uh, mentioned.